So everyone, please give a warm round of applause for John Graham Cumming and Kit Eaton, who are going to be with us in a short minute. One round of applause, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to being here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Apparently, we have to speak loud. Apparently, we do have to speak loud. Today, which is yeah. very hard for two British people to yes. speak. Bear with like us that, if we, so. uh, if we um, trail off. Fade away. So, um, John, one of, the, um, one of the fun questions I'd like to ask is, uh, Cloudflare is a brand that everyone knows. But how would you give a 30-second elevator pitch for, for the company? Um, so when I joined Cloudflare, the idea was that only a small number of companies around the world had access to the best performance, the best security, the best availability, right? So it was like Google and Amazon and Yahoo at the time, you know, companies like this. And it was unfair that not everybody had the same level of access, the same playing field. And the idea was you should be able to make speed, security, privacy, availability, available as a service, and that's what we did. That's a very neat pitch. I think I'd listen to that in an elevator. Um, so we're here on the developer stage today, and we're talking about infrastructure and innovation. And we're going to focus on the cloud. What does the traditional cloud look like to you? Well, first of all, it's kind of amazing that we're talking about traditional cloud, right? So, uh, and to sort of set the, the stage on that, if you think about the sort of two revolutions we've been through in computing prior to AI, we'll talk about that later perhaps, 2006 and 2007, so 18 and 17 years ago, you have the first iPhone, which really kicked off the mobile everything revolution, right? And the access from everywhere. And you have Amazon Web Services EC2. So we are, we are 16 or 17 years into this thing. So I guess, uh, given how fast things move, we're in traditional cloud. I think the real thing to think about the cloud is, and particularly when you think about what Amazon did, but others too, is what they want to do is capture your data. You're being the company, not you as an individual, but you're you the company. Um, and this is very obvious in what they do. If they can get your data into their system, it is going to be very hard for you to leave. Um, and you see this through some things like the fact that Amazon and others charge egress. So actually it would cost you a lot just to remove your data. Um, they don't charge you to put stuff in. Right, so they, you, know, you can upload as much data as you want. So they really are about capturing your fundamental data, which is probably a lot of, you know, a big part of the value of your business is in the data you have, and then providing you services on top of it. Of course, they don't tell you that's what they're doing. They tell you about the services they're providing. And it's, a, I mean, it's an understandable business model. They want to lock you in for as long as possible so that they can, um, they can profit from you for, a, for as long as possible and keep selling you services and services and services. How do we break that paradigm? How do we change the, into a new cloud? And what does a new cloud look like? So uh, I think if you think about kind of historically what happened in computing, at one point, computing was fairly synonymous with IBM, right? And um, people had very large IBM installations which covered everything. It covered the computing and the storage and the networking and the access. I mean, all that stuff was in one thing. And a lot of, you know, there's this famous saying, right, about people never got fired for buying IBM because they made it reliable, they made it available, they upgraded it, they made it backward compatible. To this day, actually, if you have IBM mainframe hardware, you're, you're backward compatible through many, many generations of software. So that was a hell of a value proposition, right? And we have something a bit similar with the cloud, right? Which is that you, know, you don't see the cloud providers deprecating their services. You see them supporting everything you have on there. You see people getting, in, in a sense, locked in partly by the data, but partly by that ecosystem that they've, they've built into a bit like they did with IBM. Well, what happened really with the, sort of the change away from IBM, and obviously people, a lot of people still use their infrastructure, especially in some of the older businesses, um, is a different paradigm, basically, right? So suddenly you've got client server and then you've got the web essentially happening, which changed the way in which people built stuff. So it's really sort of a cycle happening. And I think what we're seeing now is not 
sort of the death of the cloud, but also sort of a cycle of like, okay, how should I build my applications? At one point, way back, the answer was on an IBM thing because it would be reliable. Another point it was on Amazon or another cloud provider because of the service it provided. Now I think there's a cycle realization where a combination of the lock-in and the cost, which also happened back in the mainframe days and has happened with the cloud, is gonna happen again. And so we're gonna see a new cycle emerge. Do you think uh, traditional cloud is sort of a monolith? It's a, it's, you can imagine it's a single service. You buy a single service and the cloud was the same thing for, for everyone who is applying to access it. Do we think you're going to see more and more personalization of the cloud? Are we going to find cloud, uh, edge cloud computing and things like this? Well, I'm not sure I really believe in this idea of edge computing, actually. Um, so people talk about that. Yeah. Um, this idea that there's, there's some concept of the edge. And if you talk to the mobile phone companies, they have a different concept of the edge, which means inside their mobile phone network. Um, if you talk to some of the cloud providers, they might talk about edge being uh, something that is close to the end user. I think the reality is what people want to do is build an application and have it scale um, without really thinking about the scaling, right? So they, they want to say, I have some code, I want that code to run in the best location for that code. And um, that's gonna be on some sort of a network which has widespread availability. And where the code runs, maybe it's close to the end user, which is perhaps what edge means in the sort of CDM world. But maybe it's not, because maybe it actually makes more sense for that code to run close to a database somewhere, because from a performance perspective, or maybe that code needs to run in a certain city or region because of privacy laws, because of data protection laws. There's a lot of variation. So I think it's really not about edge versus monolith cloud or whatever. It's more about the flexibility that comes if you have something which is highly granular. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the existing clouds are just not very granular. I mean, they're, they're called hyperscalers because they have hyper data centers where they have a lot of stuff, what you really want is an incredible amount of granularity. So, you know, if you're a German healthcare care provider, you can say, my code only runs inside Germany, let's say, or you're a European retailer, you say, my code only runs inside Europe, or you say, I don't care where it runs, I want the best performance, and the code can move around. So I think that's where we're, we're moving for us. And in a way, we were talking earlier about the old days of early computing, um, what developers really want is to write their code, have it run on their machine, and then not worry about it again. And I think that's what the newer cloud hopefully can provide. Can we talk a little bit about how Cloudflare is servicing developers in this new kind of environment? Yeah, I mean, we built a thing called Cloudflare Workers about, um, well, it's about seven years ago now, which is the ability for someone to write code and us run it. Uh, and in its first iteration, it was, um, you know, you give us some code, we will execute it uh, pretty much always close to the end user because we have about 330 cities where we have hardware. Um, and so we can run that code anywhere. And we've built a system that allows us to run this very large network around the world and decide where code can run. And then over time, because we have a lot of information about the, the performance of applications, of the performance of the internet, we can move the code around to the best place. So we can say, well, maybe it shouldn't run next to this end user because uh, it turns out that if it runs close to this other service they're calling, it's better because that, maybe that service is running in Amazon you know, US East. And if we run the code closer to US East, the overall performance is better. But we can make that decision. The developer does not have to make that decision. We will dynamically move the code around within the constraints of privacy or performance or security. Um. This is Web Summit, and it's this year, so we would be remiss to not talk about AI and the implications of AI for nearly every part of technology. One thing I'd like to question you about is the, the GPU gap. Mm -hmm. So we all know that big AI models rely on vast computing resources, yeah. mainly in North America, and that might be a challenge for developers in Europe and elsewhere in the world. How does that problem get solved? Well, I think it, I think it gets solved by uh, two things. One is that the... Um, a lot of the work that's going on with AI is around open source models 
Now, we mustn't forget there are European models, right? There's Mistral, which is doing great stuff in France, but there's a lot of open source models. And what people are doing is they are building on top of those open source models. So they're taking Llama, for example, and they're specializing it in some way, and they're building a service around it. And so the training is one part of it, and I, I agree with you that there is kind of a GPU gap, if you like. There's a concentration of GPUs in the US. Um, but the inference, the bit where you're actually using the AI, is happening all over the world. And so what we've done is we have a product called Workers AI. In about half of our cities worldwide, so 180 cities, we have deployed GPUs. So where you want to run an application on the Cloudflare network, where you can also execute a model, do inference on it. Um, and so we have customers who've built their model, specialized maybe Llama or something in a way, and then we do the execution for them. And again, we can decide where it executes for the best performance, for the best GPU type, the best latency, whatever the requirements are um, around the world. And I think that really addresses that because no matter where your, your business is or where your customers are, we are close to them. Uh, we can provide the best service, whether it's running, you know, running code or even the old CDN services of content or executing some AI model on the, on the network. This sounds like you're doing a lot of predicting of, of what the developer's needs are, um, which leads me to my next question. How is Cloudflare using AI internally? It, is it solving some of these problems using AI-based solutions? Yeah, I mean, we always have been, right? So, I mean, from the beginning, Cloudflare has been um, very much around machine learning. In fact, my background goes back about 20 years in machine learning when I was doing stuff around anti-spam and we were using machine learning. Um, the, we have always used uh, you know, learning methods to make predictions about where code should execute, where the best place for content is, um, and we're doing more and more of it. So, for example, we have a project right now which is designed to predict the performance of the internet itself at a very granular level. And so, for example, we want to go around and be able to say, um, you know, at the lowest level, at the TCP level, there are different parameters you can tune, right, to make the performance better. We can know from our monitoring of real patterns that, let's say, the biggest mobile phone provider in Bucharest has better performance with these parameters during the rush hour. And so we should dynamically tune that um, in real time. And different from, you know, uh, a Portuguese fiber customer on a Sunday morning. It's not a level playing field. And we have the data to do that. So from a user perspective, again, whatever you put on Cloudflare, we should then provide the best environment for that, performance-wise, security-wise, whatever. And so we'll use AI for that. And of course, we're using AI a lot internally um, to look at data about the performance and security of things. On the security side, we are successfully seeing new hacker attacks uh, before they become CVEs. So we're, we're seeing what we call negative days. So rather than zero days, we're actually seeing new attack types. And for example, when um, Log4j happened, or log for, um, you know, when that happened just before Christmas a couple of years ago, um, we were already blocking it before it became public because we'd, we'd seen a new type of behavior. And actually, we were able to see the first moments it was started being used. Um, and we knew that, in fact, it had not been successfully exploited before the public disclosure. We knew that, in fact, that the, it was only the researchers who tested it against their own test websites. But that vis visibility into security on the internet and the ability to predict new things, see new types of attacks, um, comes from uh, using machine learning and AI on this vast amount of data about you know, performance security and on, on the internet. Another use, for, <clears throat> excuse me, another use for AI is, of course, to help developers and content creators defend against AI itself. So there's a tool you guys, you guys have which is helping um, content creators prevent scraping and things like this. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the thing about the scraping side of things is that fundamentally, prior to uh, building these large language models using everything on the web, uh, and particularly around the sort of search that uses AI, um, there was a sort of gentleman's agreement between the search engines and everybody else, which is that the search engines were allowed to scrape your website 
subject to robots.txt, you could tell them not to do stuff. Um, because they were going to send you traffic. Right? They, they, there was a mutual benefit from this thing, right? I mean, Google and others got very large by saying, oh, John's website is over here when you're looking for this type of content. And I was like, fine, yeah, scrape my website. Now, what's happened with the search kind of AI is that everything gets sucked into this big thing. And the end user is going and doing a search and may never go to your website. And so this has changed the balance. And so a lot of publishers and content creators are worried about this. And so we have a tool which allows them to, you to see um, what is happening with the scraping by the AI clause, um, and then you know, decide whether you want to allow it or not. And so that is a tool with AI audit, which has come out. And there are also people who philosophically are against this, right? It's not just about money. I mean, I, I, mean, I think there are, you know, there's, there's a monetary one, which is I should be making money when the AI person. There's also, I don't want to participate in the destruction of mankind by the creation of a super intelligence, so please don't include my content, right? That's the second one. And the third one is um, <clears throat> what I'm putting on the internet is an, is an artistic creation, and um, that is my artistic creation, and I don't want that to be uh, sort of a you know, simulation of that created in some AI because it is truly an expression of who I am as a person. And so all of those three reasons seem pretty legit to me. And so this is what AI allow, audit allows you to do, is go and look at that and say, what, um, what's, what's scraping my content, and what do I want to allow or disallow? Because the old world of this agreement between search and content has broken down. As a content creator, I'm very aware of this exact uh, fact at the moment. Um, we've got about a minute left. Could you just touch on what you think the future of the developer is in the era of AI? <laughs> no, I actually, I, I actually think that the, the AI um, we're seeing around developers is utterly fantastic. I think the history of computing is that the people who could be developers, um, the group of people who could be developers has expanded over time. So the, if you go back into like the 1950s, only a few like hardcore weirdos were programmers because they had to know so much about how computers worked, right? They were writing an assembly language and they knew about all sorts of timing stuff and all the weird stuff. And then over time, you know, you had like the basic language created and more people in Fortran and other things. And you had more and more assistance. And then you, you just view the world as expanding. Visual Basic gets created, Excel gets functions, right? More and more people become programmers. So I view the world as getting more and more programmers because AI can assist them in doing things they couldn't previously do, especially because the syntax and the sort of pitfalls in programming are so difficult that you actually want a machine to say, uh, no, you, you need the semicolon there, and I'll put that semicolon in there for you, and I will let you express what you're trying to do. So I think we're in a golden age of being a programmer, where we have this incredible assistance, and more and more people can call themselves developer. So AI is a developer's friend. That's actually a nice thing to, to end our talk with. So thanks very much for talking to us today. Thank you very much, everyone.